So despite the Apollo moon hoax, there are people who still believe that man is in space and we have all sorts of space vehicles and satellites and space stations up there. It's time to have a look at the space shuttle. So let's take a look at a typical shuttle launch. T minus 17 seconds in count. 15, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 8, 8, start, start, 2, 1, boost for ignition and lift off of the space shuttle discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Now, I'd like to stop it there for a moment because I'd like to draw your attention to the shuttle's trajectory. Now, as a kid, I often wondered why it was that all rockets and space shuttle launches, they never ever went straight up. They always curved off to one side. Now, I remember being told at the time that it's because the Earth is spinning and the rocket is actually still going straight up, but from our point of view, we're just spinning away from it, so it looks curved. Hmm. Well, you can't have it both ways. If, uh, if that's the case, then when we jump into the air, we should land about a kilometre to the west. So you can't have it both ways. The quickest way into orbit would be straight up. Going horizontal would be the long way round. Let's continue. Okay, at this point, the shuttle is horizontal. That is, it's not getting any higher, it's simply travelling horizontally along the ground. And as you'll see in a few seconds, when the booster rockets separate, they still fall to the ground under the influence of so-called gravity. Solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Guidance now converging. Discoveries on board computers commanding the main engine nozzles to swivel, aiming the shuttle for its precise target in space for main engine cutoff. Discovery Houston, negative return. Copy, negative return. So, ground based video ends there. Not because the shuttle is too high, but because it's too far away downrange. As I said, it's travelling horizontally at this point. So what's missing is what they call MECO, main engine cutoff. That means the, the shuttle no longer has any power behind it whatsoever. But after MECO is the external tank separation. As you can see from this diagram, when the tank separates, it falls back to Earth. So what's stopping the space shuttle following the same exact trajectory? Between main engine cutoff and this ohms burn, the space shuttle should follow the exact same trajectory as the external tank. But it magically does not. And conveniently, there's no video cameras to show exactly what happens. The point here is that at external tank separation, 
both the shuttle and the external tank are subject to this so-called force of gravity. Neither the shuttle or the external tank are in space. And yet they want us to believe that there is an orbital manoeuvring system which is capable of blasting the shuttle from this point, which is still in the Earth's atmosphere, into orbit. Well, the clue is in the name of the thing. Orbital manoeuvring system, not orbital insertion system. Where's the fuel for this? There isn't an external tank anymore, so there isn't enough fuel to blast this shuttle into orbit, even from this height. And on the subject of height, where does space actually begin? In this shot, the space shuttle is supposedly in space, because the cargo bay doors are open. But you can see the features on the ground in great detail. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to see such detail from a passenger jet at 35,000 feet. Look, you can see roads and rivers and individual fields. Anyway, once the shuttle's completed its mission, it's now a glider. So let's have a look at a video of a glider landing. Now let's take a look at NASA's glider landing and pay particular attention to the sound of non-existent jet engines powering down after landing. Unlocked. Main gear touchdown. Nose gear touchdown. Deploying of the drag chute to delay to assess uh, the conditions of the crosswinds on the orbiter as it rolls out on the uh, runway. 1-5 at the Kennedy Space Center wrapping up a nearly 5.3 million mile mission. Endeavor returning the first educator mission specialist Barbara Morgan to Earth to begin the next step in her journey to inspire future generations to explore, learn, and build a better future. Undoubtedly, the nice woman from NASA, employed to state the bleeding obvious, is there to distract you from the fact that it's a bloody jet plane, tarted up to look like a space shuttle. It's not a glider at all. You can clearly hear the jet engines powering down. When you look at the back of the space shuttle, you can see two odd-shaped pods. These are supposedly the orbital manoeuvring system. On the front of these pods are two odd-shaped holes. Hmm. Why would a rocket engine need some kind of air intake? Wouldn't it be dangerous to put such air intakes on the back of a shuttle, which on takeoff is going over 10,000 miles an hour? Wouldn't they just rip right off? Very strange. No, these holes are precisely what you'd have if you wanted to hide an air intake to a jet engine. So here's a conspiracy theory. If I was on the receiving end of upwards of 200 billion of taxpayers' money, perhaps this is what I would do. I'd spend a few million on some of what they call hero models. Space shuttle mock-ups that look the part, have lots of flashing lights and computer screens and stuff, but are not flyable. They'll end up collecting dust in museums anyway. 
Then I would have a few mock-ups that I would fly into space, but really would basically fly out of sight and ditch in the sea, getting destroyed in the process. Then I would spend a few million, perhaps even a billion, let's give the taxpayers their money's worth. Perhaps I'll spend a billion or so on developing a plane that looks like the space shuttle. There you go, job done. Uh, no refunds. So let's change the launch profile of the space shuttle for my new classified one. We have a remote controlled, full size mock-up, basically nothing inside, just an empty shell. That's uh, flown up on remote control, on a, essentially a big firework. Everything acts as normal. The booster rockets detach as normal. But when we get to the external tank separation, that doesn't actually happen. What actually happens is the tank and the shuttle fall back to Earth, where they ditch in the sea and get destroyed in the process. After the mission's complete, a space shuttle plane takes off from an undisclosed location and lands at an Air Force base in front of the TV cameras. Simple. Don't be ridiculous, Dave. You couldn't fake something like that. There'd be too many people involved. And the truth is bound to get out. Lam, 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 lam. The best example of space shuttle fakery is the Challenger disaster. In 1986, the shuttle Challenger exploded about 74 seconds after takeoff, killing all seven astronauts inside. Or did it? It turns out that six of the seven are still alive and kicking today. Ellison Onizuka claims to be his identical twin brother, Claude. Yeah, I've got an identical twin brother, Claude, too. The Challenger pilot, Mickey Smith, hasn't even bothered changing his name. He's now Professor Michael J. Smith of University of Wisconsin. Now, Krista McAuliffe was a bit of a sneaky one. She was the Challenger payload specialist, quite famous for being a teacher. It turns out, during her astronaut days, she was using her middle name, Krista. And now she goes by her first name, Sharon and she's a Syracuse law professor. The Challenger commander, Francis Richard Scobie, is now Dick Scobie, which sounds like a rather unpleasant disease, a CEO of Cows in Trees Limited. Judith Resnick, the Challenger mission specialist, again hasn't even bothered changing her name. She's a professor at Yale Law. And finally, Ronald McNair, another Challenger mission specialist, claims to be his identical twin brother, Carl McNair. What are the odds? And now we come to the imaginings of this man here. Arthur C. Clarke, Freemason and science fiction writer, came up with the concept of the telecommunication satellite. And several years later, we have thousands of telecommunication satellites supposedly spinning around the planet. Again, though, strangely enough, if you try and look for images of communication satellites, despite the fact that there are thousands of these things up there, you don't actually find a photograph of them. Just lots and lots of CGI photoshopped images. The problem is that satellites inhabit a region of the upper atmosphere known as the thermosphere. It gets its name because the temperatures up there reach something in the order of 2,500 degrees centigrade. This is a source of some confusion. Although Wikipedia says that it reaches such high temperatures, it also says, paradoxically, that you wouldn't actually feel the heat because there's not enough air molecules up there to heat you up. Yeah, right. doesn't quite work like that. The vacuum of space is actually a perfect insulator, which is why we use a vacuum barrier in thermos flasks. The heat from the inside cannot be conducted or convected to the outside. The sun's radiation does not actually heat space up. As I said, the vacuum is a perfect insulator. The sun's radiation traverses space until it hits some object. 
And when it does, that object absorbs the heat and the temperature rises and keeps rising. And without an atmosphere to conduct or convect the heat away, the temperature will rise up to and over 2,500 degrees. So the Hubble telescope, for instance, would look something like this. All the satellites and the space shuttle and the International Space Station, they would all be molten slabs of metal spinning around in orbit. But let's put that aside for a moment. There are supposedly between 25,000 and 50,000 satellites in orbit. But let's have a look at some videos supposedly from the International Space Station. Can you see any one of these 26,000 to 50,000 satellites? I can't. commands a substantial view over the Earth's surface, and yet you don't see a single satellite. Now I do accept that you can look up into the night sky and see what we're told are satellites. I've done it myself. I've seen bright lights moving across the sky, but I have no idea what those things are. In this video, you can see several large bright objects. However, none of them appear on any satellite tracking applications. When you look up at a jet airliner flying at 35,000 feet, you can only see it as a small dot. So how is it if something the size of a jumbo jet is rendered as a small dot at about 5 to 7 miles up, that you can see a satellite which is the size of between a car and a school bus? At a hundred miles away, you just wouldn't see it. At about this point, somebody's bound to say, what about the global positioning system? How would that work without satellites? Well, as it happens, the technology has actually been around since World War II. There are actually two systems, one called LORAN and another called DECA. Those were navigation systems based on radio triangulation. Now, the GPS systems that we're used to now are basically the same systems, just improved with a new computer interface. Similarly, the international telephone traffic that's supposedly handled by satellites are handled by undersea fiber optic cables. Shortwave radio can also span large distances and also be bounced off the ionosphere. So, in the absence of any hard physical evidence... I submit that satellites are just a work of fiction and another way that NASA and the US military managed to con the American public out of billions of dollars. So let's turn our attention to the International Space Station. This is one of those occasions where we can't really trust two-dimensional media because all we have is images and video that supposedly prove that there's an International Space Station up there and it's been manned since 1999. One of the most visible indications that there are people up in space inside the International Space Station is that they're in zero gravity. However, NASA has an aircraft known as the Vomit Comet and when this aircraft takes a certain flight path the people inside feel weightlessness. So it's almost certain 
that NASA has an aircraft fitted out to look like the International Space Station's interior. Now take a look at this. Hello, Katie. Notice how suddenly as she starts to wave, Hello. she floats out of control. The same thing happens here. As the plane starts its zero-g dive, the people start to spontaneously float upwards. The other problem with this technique is that this aircraft can only simulate zero gravity in 45 second to a minute bursts. So NASA employs many little tricks here to uh, simulate weightlessness. None of their footage is live. It's all pre-recorded and edited. So plenty of scope there to use some of the cinematic tricks that we used to, like harnesses and wires that are edited out later with CGI. But here we can see one of the tricks they use to maintain continuity between periods of weightlessness. Take a look at this woman's hair. Doesn't it look a bit strange to you? Look how it seems to spring back into place. We're led to believe that uh, this is an effect of weightlessness, that the hair will just sort of float around. But it doesn't quite seem natural, does it? Here's video from the Vomit Comet again. Watch the way this woman's hair flows as she moves. seems quite obvious now that this is some kind of perm or hairspray so that between periods of weightlessness we get that visual continuity. Now there are plenty of examples of these gravitational anomalies but I'm not going to spend too much time on it I just wanted to show that all these things that you can see from NASA can be simulated and CGI'd up for your benefit. They don't seem to do any real scientific experiments up there. The effort seems to be just to get you to believe that they're there. That's it. There are also plenty of anomalies when you look at spacewalks. For footage of spacewalks on the exterior of the International Space Station, NASA will freely admit they have a huge swimming pool called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab where they train their astronauts and within this huge swimming pool, they have a mock-up of the exterior of the International Space Station. I'm going to show you a video from a YouTuber called Jungle Surfer, who's done the best expose of spacewalking anomalies. Another aspect of the illusion of space travel is space walks. These are faked inside a swimming pool. It's a custom-built swimming pool and that's a great way to fake zero gravity. About six months ago, in 2013, a gallon of water leaked into one of their spacesuits in a matter of seconds. NASA doesn't really have a proper explanation for how on earth this could have happened. There shouldn't be water leaking into someone's helmet and a person almost drowning in space. How can you drown in space? They now wear snorkels to make sure that they don't drown in space. How can this be happening? A snorkel in space? There could be some water in the porous plate sublimator. When they were on the moon, they supposedly had a, about a gallon of water, but that cooling system is supposed to be well away from their head. There really is no sane explanation for why a gallon of water would leak into someone's spacesuit, unless you realise the whole thing is faked inside a swimming pool. In this scene, you can see the Chinese spacewalk, and you can see a bubble coming up from the guy's suit. How do you have a bubble in space? Space is supposed to be a vacuum, not a swimming pool, but it's obviously just a swimming pool filled with water. Obviously, there would be some equipment that they could only fix from the outside, but a lot of these spacewalks, it seems like equipment they easily could have configured to be accessible from the inside of the International Space Station, it seems more like an excuse to get out and show their other space trick, which is the faking of spacewalks in a swimming pool. In this vid, you catch a glimpse of someone wearing a scuba tank. Scuba tanks in space?
Snorkels and scuba tanks in space? They act like a spacewalk is just a walk in the park, like there's very little danger involved at all. They're looking through the spacesuits. Oh, <laughs> here's a spacesuit. We're going to go for a spacewalk. As if there's no danger at all. Like they don't care. They don't care. They, they don't act like they're in a life-threatening situation. Like they could die at any second, even though they can. So you would think to preserve their life, they would want to minimise the amount of spacewalking that they did. But there seems to be an abundance of equipment on the outside of the International Space Station that constantly requires repairing, which makes for a good TV spectacle and is inspired by movies like Sandra Bullock's Gravity. And after Gravity came out, they, of course, had to do another spacewalk to fix some emergency some piece of equipment that their lives depend on that, amazingly, they can fix every time. But you know what? Thanks to the genius of the engineers at NASA, they employ snorkels in space now, so that should stop them from drowning. Finally, I'm going to leave the last word to one of the astronauts themselves when he made a tiny little slip-up during a question-and-answer session. Take note of his body language after he makes his mistake. Hello, my name is Bailey. Uh, this question is for Chris. What was high school like for you? Well, it was the uh, 1980s, so the music was different, the hairstyle was different, the clothes we wore were different uh, than today, but probably in five or ten years it'll be the same. And uh, in, in school, I was just like you, probably all of you there. I, I tried my best. I didn't always succeed, didn't always do well, but I, I, I put my best effort into school. Math and science were kind of my favorite subject. I didn't really like uh, English and in, in reading too much, but I've since grown out of that, and I enjoy reading now. And I played a lot of sports. And all of that happened in a little town called York, Maine, across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. Whoops. Called York, Maine, across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. Hello, my name is Steve Owen. I'm a teacher here at Riverside Prep. I'd like to ask you about the stress associated with the long periods in the space station. I'd like to ask Karen, uh, what is the training that you get to cope with that stress and related psychological issues? Well, for psychological issues, actually, when we're when we are selected as astronauts, we go through quite a quite a vigorous psychological screening process. Um, you certainly don't want somebody who can who comes up here and and, and has a breakdown or is claustrophobic. Um, but also, we have um, well, like Chris's background as a Navy SEAL and Luca's background as a test pilot, clearly prepare them for high stress situations. Um, I could also argue that going through through your, the process of getting a PhD can be a high stress, <laughs> high stress thing as well. And so, generally, when people get to the point where these they're applying for these this job, they've been through um, s several things in their life that are high stress and have proven that it that they can handle humans in space. <coughs> I'm not even sure there is such a thing as space anymore. So, could the Earth really be flat? Most people, when they think of a flat Earth, immediately think, what happens when you get to the edge? Well, the flat Earth model is a flat circular disk with a north magnetic pole in the centre, and all the continents are laid out around it. On the edge of this disk is a wall of ice, and we call it Antarctica. There is no South Pole. That's why you can't fall off the flat Earth. The wall of ice keeps the oceans in and stops you from reaching the edge. Strangely enough, the only other place that this model is used is in the United Nations logo. Looks like they know something that we don't. As you can see on the UN logo, the flat earth map is overlaid with a grid. And that grid divides the earth into 33 sections. Hmm. And also, there's no Antarctica on this map. It's almost as if that grid 
were like bars, like a cell, locking us away from Antarctica, which is precisely what they're doing. The United Nations countries are all signatories to the Antarctica Treaty, which basically bans anybody from going to Antarctica. And if there's any absolute proof of either the globe Earth or the flat one, then I believe the answers would be in Antarctica. But before we examine Antarctica, I'd like to take a look at flights in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, this information came to me through Mark Sargent and his Flat Earth Clues. A lot of people say that Mark is a shill. I communicated with him over email. He seemed like a decent bloke. So I'm not going to say he's a shill. He has his ideas, his views, his perspectives, as I have mine, and everybody else has theirs. So I'm not going to say he's a shill. But nonetheless, his Flat Earth Clues were very well done, and I got a lot out of them. So thank you, Mark. The crux of this issue is the lack of direct flights in the Southern Hemisphere. I took a look at some of these flights and uh, particularly focused on flights from Cape Town to Auckland, New Zealand. Generally, flights in the Southern Hemisphere tend to be indirect with one or more connections and lengthy layovers. Such is the case with this one from Cape Town to Auckland. This flight came out around about 37 hours with a connecting flight in Dubai. Now, if you look on a map, Cape Town to Auckland is a straight shot across the Indian Ocean, 7,310 miles. That should take about 12 hours. But in this case, we're taking thousands of miles north to Dubai, then back down south to Melbourne, and then across to Auckland. It doesn't make any sense. Until, that is, you look at it on the Flat Earth model. Now you can see it's a straight line from Cape Town to Dubai to Melbourne. And the distance is more like 16,000 miles. So the total journey time of 37 hours is there to hide the fact that your actual flight time is 26 hours rather than 11 or 12. Now, I did find one direct flight operated by Qantas. But who knows, the flight was 14 hours long, but does that flight actually exist? I don't know. Short of booking that flight and flying it, I wouldn't know. But it strikes me that you could advertise such a flight, price it beyond the reach of most people, and cancel it for anybody who does take it. But that's just speculation. Now, the GPS system would obviously show up any anomalies in the flight plan, but it seems they've found a very simple way of uh, getting around that problem. And that is switching off GPS tracking for all flights in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, this is an image from Flight Tracker, and you can see straight off that in the Northern Hemisphere, you will see planes over the ocean, but there are none in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, I spent some time looking at it on, on flighttracker.com and I actually verified this information, but I couldn't capture the data on my computer. So here's a video of planes disappearing and reappearing off the tracking systems. So hey guys, I'm on planefinder.net. I'm tracking airplanes in the southern hemisphere trying to do some research to verify or debunk this flat earth guy. And what he said is that airplanes disappear in the South Atlantic near the, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere when they fly over oceans. And it's true. I was f tracking a British Airways flight from Buenos Aires to London. And I was tracking, I was tracking, and then it disappeared. And then I clicked on this plane right here, Qatar. See how the flight path, like when you click on the plane, the flight path uh, appears or disappears, right? So I clicked on this plane looking for my British Airways flight, and I found this flight, and look, see how the flight path just starts in the middle of nowhere right here? This flight path starts in the middle of nowhere. That's because what they do with flights in the Southern Hemisphere is they disappear and they turn off the GPS over the ocean and then they reappear the flights about an hour before landing and that's exactly what the flat earth guy said they do and that's exactly what they're doing <laughs> wow. 
guy. This guy's going to Rome. Okay. So this is a uh, this is a pretty good flight to track because he's going all the way to Europe. So I just clicked on this flight. Same thing. This guy. We should have saw him before when we were tracking the other plane. And when we were tracking this plane that's heading to Rome. But this guy, when we were tracking the plane headed to Rome, he wasn't even on the map. He's coming from Abu Dhabi. It's in the Middle East. He's been in the air for what, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours? He's been in the air for 7,000 miles, and we're just picking him up right here. <laughs> we're just picking him up in the middle of nowhere. Look, they disappeared the flight over the entire ocean, and they're reappearing for landing about an hour before landing. Think about it. He's got 500 miles to go. It's about an hour before landing, just like the flat earth guy said. I mean, take a look at what this guy's flight path should look like on a flat earth model. This stuff's crazy. You have to look into this for yourselves. Don't pretend like you know everything because you only know what you've been taught and we know that the stuff we've been taught was a bunch of bullshit. So we need to question everything. Question everything. But don't believe everything. Question everything. There's a big difference. Now, I know a lot of this evidence seems circumstantial, but there are many flights in the Southern Hemisphere that have stopovers in seemingly nonsensical places that only make sense on a flat Earth. Santiago, Chile to Auckland, for instance, stops over in Los Angeles. Nonsensical on a globe makes perfect sense on a flat Earth. And the only way to verify these flight paths just happens to be switched off for all Southern Hemisphere flights. Circumstantial, I'll grant you, but compelling nonetheless. So let's take a close look at Antarctica. The first thing you'd encounter when you reached Antarctica would be a 200 foot wall of ice, followed by 300 miles of Antarctic desert. No life no vegetation, and temperatures that drop to minus 100 degrees centigrade. And if you manage to survive that, then you encounter a mountain range two miles high. Those mountains are called the Rockefeller Mountains, and at the top is the Rockefeller Plateau. Interesting. And beyond that, nobody knows what's there. Apart from maybe one man. Richard E. Byrd. Admiral Byrd led three expeditions down to Antarctica. Now the last two weren't just expeditions, they were military operations. Operation High Jump and Operation Deep Freeze. And here's Admiral Byrd explaining what he found down there. Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth? Uh, yes, there is. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm -hmm down at the bottom of the world. Why this interest in the bottom of the world? Nobody living down there, is there? It happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. What are they? What, uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains. It's not covered with snow. Enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals. Uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world. Now, by far, the coldest spot in the world. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there, and there's evidence, probably uranium there. 
As I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long. Because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year. Immediately after Admiral Burr's last expedition, the Antarctic Treaty was signed and nobody was allowed to go there. Bearing in mind all the mineral resources, unlimited coal, unlimited oil, uranium, and an entire continent the size of North America lying unexplored. Now, we're talking about countries who burn down rainforests without batting an eyelid, or put up drilling rigs at the merest sniff of oil, or destroy pristine countryside to build fracking wells. Do you think for one moment any of these countries or corporations will leave all that untapped wealth unexploited? Something doesn't ring true. Now, I don't know for sure that we live on a flat earth, but I do know that we're not clinging onto the surface of a ball. And now let's look at the how and why. How have they managed to pull this off? Well, indoctrination since childhood. There's pretty much a globe in every classroom, and it's just a given that the world is a sphere. Even our language reflects it. Global finance and around the globe. And when we're taught things in childhood and everything we look at supports that view, then we rarely go back and re-examine it. But far and away the main basis of our belief is the supposed history of our scientific endeavour. What most people don't realise is that all the characters in this story are all actors in the same club. As George Carlin put it, it's a big club and you're not in it. But Ptolemy, who first put forward the heliocentric model, was acknowledged as the first mason. Copernicus was a Jesuit priest. Sir Isaac Newton was a Freemason. All the astronauts are Freemasons. So you can see how this lie could work if all these celebrated people are telling the same story. Another way we're programmed is by centralised and complete control over space information and access to space. That control is held by the space agencies around the world, NASA and RASA and the European Space Agency. It turns out that NASA is essentially composed of Nazis. Look up Operation Paperclip. NASA was actually formed from Nazi scientists transplanted to America after the war. I need not remind most people that the Nazi approach to propaganda is if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. And finally, we've had decades of programming through entertainment media. Over a hundred years of science fiction books and stories and television programs and films. I must admit to being a science fiction fan myself. I grew up watching Star Trek, Star Wars, Babylon 5, Battlestar Galactica, watching films like 2001, 2010. I truly believed that our future lay in space. I saw an exciting future for mankind. Moon bases, Mars bases, interstellar travel. But now I sincerely doubt there is any such thing as space. It turns out that the Bible had a very clear conception of what the Earth and the universe looks like. And that matches the flat Earth model more than it does the globe. And that only leaves why. Why have they done this? What's the point of this grand deception? I think Eric Dubay explains it best. That's right. Yeah, I mean, our eyes and experience tell us the Earth is flat and motionless and everything in the sky revolves around us. But when we cease to believe our own eyes and experience, we have to prostrate ourselves at the feet of these very pseudo-scientists who are blinding us, treat them as experts, astronomical priests, who have special knowledge only they can access, like the Hubble telescope. So by brainwashing us of something so gigantic and fundamental, it actually makes every other kind of lesser indoctrination a piece of cake. <laughs> Earth 
being the flat, fixed center of the universe around which everything in the heavens revolves, gives a special importance and significance not only to Earth, but to us humans, the most intelligent among the intelligent designers' designs. By turning Earth into a spinning ball thrown around the sun and shot through infinite space from a godless Big Bang, they turn humanity into a random, meaningless, purposeless accident of a blind, dumb universe. Mm -hmm. So it's like trauma-based mind control beating the divinity out of us with their mental manipulations. Uh, people are always asking, you know, why do they do this? I mean, this is, I mean, other than the obvious profit margin motive, NASA being the biggest black budget black hole in existence, sucking in over $30 billion taxpayer money for the fake moon landings alone. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, hundreds of billions of dollars, and not just NASA, but RASA and all the other fake space organizations around the world giving CGI images for hundreds of billions of dollars. So this modern atheist Big Bang heliocentric globe Earth chance evolution paradigm spiritually controls humanity by removing God or any sort of intelligent design and replaces purposeful divine creation with haphazard random cosmic coincidence. And so by removing Earth from the motionless center of the universe, these masons have moved us physically and metaphysically from a place of supreme importance to one of complete nihilistic indifference. If the Earth is the center of the universe, then the ideas of God, creation, and a purpose for human existence are resplendent. But if the Earth is just one of billions of planets revolving around billions of stars and billions of galaxies, then the ideas of God, creation, and a specific purpose for Earth and human existence become highly implausible. So by surreptitiously indoctrinating us into their scientific materialist sun worship, not only do we lose faith in anything beyond the material, we gain absolute faith in materiality, superficiality, status, selfishness, hedonism, and consumerism. If there's no God and everyone's just an accident, then all that really matters is me, me, me. <laughs> so they've turned Madonna, the mother of God, into a, the material girl living in a material world. Their rich, powerful corporations with their slick sun cult logos sell us idols to worship, slowly taking over the world while we tacitly believe their science, vote for their politicians, buy their products, listen to their music, watch their movies, all sacrificing our souls at the altar of materialism. <laughs> it's, it's a big... It's a big deception. I'd say it's the, the biggest cover-up and conspiracy in history. We've been completely deluded for 500 years. So there you have it. There are a great many other points I could have raised, and I've barely scratched the surface. But if any of these points are true, then we have to abandon the model we've accepted thus far. Now, I don't know for sure that the Earth is flat. But I've seen enough evidence to make me strongly feel that that is the case. And moreover, my spidey sense, my intuition, tells me that this is true. I don't know what's beyond Antarctica. It could be a dome. It could be an infinite flat plain. It could even be just more Earth. More Earth than we realise, just as Admiral Byrd found. There are many who think that ultimately this is unimportant and just a distraction. But I see this as one of the most important revelations we could ever have. If this is the case, if this flat earth is our universe, then it elevates man and this earth to supreme importance, where every life, human or otherwise, is significant and sacred. And when we all realise that, then the world, the universe, changes. So I'd like to finish this the same way as Mark Sargent does. Do your own research and feel free to contact me. I'm dave at allegedlydave.com.